Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 28 of Feedback. Today, we are extremely pleased to welcome uh, Klaus Lang, an organist and composer, uh, as well as Stephen Miles, who is the founder of the most special, or one of the most special and wonderful uh, new music series in the United States, New Music New College in Florida. Uh, and we're here today to talk about Klaus's piece for us um, from just almost exactly three years ago. Um, we're right around the anniversary here this month uh, in 2017, and the piece is Molten Trees, and you can hear that featured on Yarn Wire Currents Volume 5. So just to remind everyone, uh, if you have questions, you can always send those ahead of time to feedback at yarnwire.org or join us in the live chat on Facebook or YouTube if you have questions you'd like to ask in real time. So with that, uh, again, thanks for joining us, and I'll hand it over to you, Steve. Thank you, Laura. It's so great to be here. Thank you for inviting me to join you for this. Um, Klaus, last year, actually October of 2019, uh, Yarn Wire came to New Music New College in Florida, and your music, Molten Trees, was the first music of the season. It was the first oh, wow. concert of the season. It was the first sounds that, that people heard uh, for that season. And uh, this piece really captivated the audience. Uh, it was a beautiful performance. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the audience had attended, many people in the audience had attended uh, a conversation that we had with Yarn Wire uh, two days before. And uh, we call these artist conversations, but you know, basically what we do in those conversations is we try to uh, reverse or alter the, uh, the usual format when you're having guests, usually you know you talk about how wonderful they are, and and then you talk about the piece they're going to play and how you're supposed to listen to it and all of those things. And eventually, after everyone's exhausted, you play a little bit of something and then ask if there are questions. And it's that's not the way to do it. So what we do is uh, we introduce the artists and just say here they are. They're going to play an ex an extended excerpt from the concert, and then they played I don't know seven or eight minutes from Molten Trees, and then. Before Yarnwire spoke or could speak, we asked the audience to respond, uh, maybe using metaphors, using whatever it was that, that struck them about the music. So they speak metaphorically mm -hmm. first and they speak from their experience. And then it's only after they've had a chance to um, explore that experience and also comparing their experiences with other members of the audience that, that then we invite uh, our guests to then respond to the audience. And it makes for, uh, it, it means that if we get into anything technical, it comes out of the discussion that's rooted in experience. Mm. Uh, so that, that works well. Now we can't exactly do that today, but I would like for us to uh, stick to that idea that we need an experience first before we can start to talk about um, how a piece was made or some of the technical issues that come up in it. So I thought what we'd do is first we'll listen to a, an excerpt, uh, then we'll have some discussion about the technical issues, and then uh, finally we'll be able to talk a little bit about, uh, Klaus, about uh, your piece of writing, uh, uh, time and politics, freedom time politics. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't we start now, if we could play the uh, first excerpt. This is... Um, not exactly at the beginning of the piece, but it's very close to the beginning. It's about seven minutes, so settle in. And, uh, and I think if you have thoughts about the piece, about what you're experiencing, uh, this would be a really good opportunity to send those in 
uh, so that we can also re respond to those. So let's hear the music.
so so we don't have an audience who can give us some immediate feedback about that performance. Uh, and I should remind folks that it, that was a seven minute excerpt from a piece that's 32 to 35 minutes long. It can vary a little bit. Um, but I would like to maybe turn to Yarnwire first. Um, in terms of, you can at least talk about the experience of playing the piece. Um, and you might, maybe I'd be interested in some of the comparisons from, you know, not, not when you were learning it, but what it was like to give the first performances and what has it been like to give the perform subsequent performances? Hmm. I mean, I think we had the benefit of performing this piece quite a few times since mm -hmm. the premiere. And I mean, the, the sort of normal thing is that, you know, with any piece, the more you have the chance to perform it, the more you feel like you know it, like you mm -hmm. feel more comfortable with it. You feel like you have a better grasp on what you need to do to present the piece in the best way possible. And, and I think that you know, I definitely feel that way each time we perform this piece. I feel like I sort of reach a different level of understanding and enjoyment with it, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you said something when you were here in October that I'm going to plug it because I thought it was really good. Um, you mentioned, this was in the artist conversation, but you mentioned that uh, how, how important it is for you to be performing it before an audience. Mm. that it becomes a shared experience. Could you talk about that or, or Ian or Russell, any of you, your own experience with that? I feel like, I mean, that's, that rings really true still to this day. You know, this piece is, is unique for so many reasons, but also one of the big ones for me is the way it encourages listening, um, not only on the part of the audience, but um, also on the part of the, the performers. Like um, the way that I interact with the music as a performer in this piece is I'm not just executing, but I'm listening to what's happening. Mm -hmm. And because of its fluid nature also, it's never the same, right? We all kind of flow through it differently each time. We, mm -hmm. New harmonies might come out based on how we're lining up. Mm -hmm. um, the overall experience is similar, if not the same every time, but I, I really look forward to playing this piece each time because I know it's going to be some new experience that's based on how I feel at the moment, the way the hall sounds, the kind of interaction with the audience and everything. And it's really, um, it's really special that way, I think. Um, and so like, yeah, I get a, a very visceral um, reaction to performing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think we're going to get into the technical aspect of this soon, but um... I think it's really key the way you refer to the way it changes the way the piece is written it changes the way you listen to each other mm -hmm. that it's not about yeah. executing your part i mean obviously musicians in an ensemble are always listening but uh the agency that performers have in this piece uh that klaus has given them within a certain limit um i think means that you have to listen to each other in a different way because every as you say every performance is going to be different yeah Ian, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, I just think um, one way that the performance of this piece has kind of evolved over time, listening to that very first performance, which I, I do still like, but I think I've gradually um, moved away from trying to create a musically dramatic moment mm -hmm. that maybe uh -huh. I was tr trying more to... Um, create in in the premiere and kind of just letting the material unfold naturally yeah, yeah. as i've gotten kind of more used to the language of, of the piece yeah i see and i think that that it's interesting how that type of listening um is connects to the audience the audience yeah. can tell that there's a different type of listening going on they can right. tell when performers are uh, maybe they've just learned a piece they were lucky to get through that piece <laughs> <laughs> they, they can tell when it's a more immersive kind of experience. And I think that, that uh, that's one of the reasons why the performance at New Music New College was so strong. It did convey, it did have that immersive quality. And mm -hmm. so Klaus, I have a question for you about this. Um, I've really enjoyed studying the piece, uh, preparing for this conversation. Uh, and, you know, it's obviously a very tightly constructed piece. That is, it's clear that from the standpoint of of melodic materials and so forth, that it's all very, uh, very beautifully put together. 
Um, but the piece, the music itself seems to discourage analytical listening. Um, how do you envision a listener's response to this piece? How did you think of the listener while you were writing it? Um, okay, there, I think the, the approach that you chose, uh, now everything is frozen. No, it's still alive. <laughs> no, okay. We're just listening very intently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. The, the, the approach that you chose uh, in presenting the piece by like playing an excerpt first and mm -hmm. uh, kind of creating a sensual experience for the audience and the audience then afterwards reflects on this. Mm -hmm. This is actually also very much my compositional process. Mm -hmm. So I always start with my sensual experience. I mean, it's always in, inside my head, but, but still, this is always the starting point. I always try to, to listen to the music, to the sounds first within my imagination, because my imagination is the only free space in the whole world. Mm -hmm. So this is the only, <laughs> only place where I can find things. And, and so I'm starting from this point and then the, as you said, the piece is very tightly constructed. So every node has a reason for being where it is written. Mm -hmm. I'm very much in this kind of medieval <laughs> renaissance. Oh, yeah, no, type you're very, it's very clear. Yeah, yeah. Of, of composing. So I really like to be very precise in, in, in composing the piece. But this is also for, let's say, I think within a musical structure, there has always to be a balance between freedom and organization. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. always to be some kind of, equilibrium between these two things. And I think I do as a composer, all the rigid straight compositional part mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to free the musicians mm -hmm. when they mm -hmm. perform the music. Mm -hmm. So for me, these two, the, the like that's the medieval Renaissance type of compositional technique is actually a tool to create a space that is much freer for the musicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is also for me, when, I mean, as, as you've mentioned, I'm also an organist and also a musician and I'm very much uh, enjoying playing all music from the 16th, 17th century and especially these kind of basso continuo pieces where you have exactly this structure. You have a figured bass so and so it's clear which chords you want to play and it's also clear the rhythmic structure and the basic structure is clear but the details of the performance Mm -hmm. They are given to the player at, yeah, in the yeah. moment of the, the performance in this particular space with this particular group of people he is performing with. And of course, with the particular audience that he is mm -hmm. playing for. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for me, this, this idea of, of performance, not as a kind of a cult to the holy score that we have to yeah. literally <laughs> uh, represent, but the score is just a means mm -hmm. that helps musicians to create a specific uh, sound experience, a specific sensual experience in this specific circumstances of this performance that is happening at, at this very moment yes. with, in this particular space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it, you really succeeded in creating a piece that does that. Um, I'd like to move on to some maybe some technical things here. And um, I think that we can call up of the top half of the, of the, this is in the introduction to the score, your notes in the score. Mm. Um, and you write uh, generally, <laughs> hope you can read that. Generally, all rhythmic structures should be played freely and very flexibly. They should not be played accurately spelling the notation, but more as floating processes. Mm. Um, and, but the piece is basically written in, I mean, in common notation in yeah. most of it's in 4-4, four, 5-4, four, yeah. four, whatever. How yeah. did you arrive at that notational solution for the objective that you had in your mind? Yeah, I mean, of course, notation is one of the central questions for any composer. I mean, to think about comp uh, notation is something that like, it's a constant theme in, in, in the life of the composer. And my notation also changed and, and you know, during the years and during the different phases of my work and also responding always to the, to the experience that you make during performances. Mm -hmm. And my general idea of notation is to try to notate as little uh, things as possible. Uh -huh. so okay. as, as clear as possible. 
with, with, with the least amount of, of, of ink <laughs> that mm -hmm. I have to use. Hmm. And um, so, so I think, so, and, um, and then, uh, as, as, as I also already said before, the, this idea of like reading a score and, and then just like seeing the performance as a kind of sonic representation of, uh, of, of the score, that's completely strange for me. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's yeah. a big problem in contemporary music, that many performances are exactly like this. Yes, I think yeah. that this is a big change that happened in the 20th century, also with old music, like also with ancient music. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that Mozart, when he performed his piano concert, concertos, played the, the solo part the way he notated it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he mm -hmm. he just, you know, he took this as a basis for his uh, performance and he didn't, you know, he, he was not interested in spelling out something that he has uh, had written down. I did, actually, very interesting. I, I don't know if you know E.T.A. Hoffmann, the German oh, sure. uh, yeah. writer, 19th yeah. century. Yeah. 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 There, there is a piece, uh, a little novella called uh, Master Gluck or something like this. Mm -hmm. And there he, he describes when, when he meets in a dark alley in Berlin, a strange guy, and it, it turns out to be the composer Christoph Philippard Gluck. And he follows with him uh, follows him into his apartment and then uh -huh. Duke sits down on the harpsichord and plays his opera. I, I forgot which yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And, and then Hoffman explains and describes how he, how freely he plays his piece. He adds something there, he adds something here, he omits something here. And I think that's a very natural way of performing yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. It's just you take the score and then you, you enjoy <laughs> using this, this skeleton to create something. And that's how, I mean, when I play my own music, it's also, I'm an organ. I organ, I'm, I'm not interested in, in spelling out my own score. I listen to what is happening and then I react to this in the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's what I try with my scores. It's like, a, the, the idea is for me of the score is I give some kind of, um, I communicate my imagination. Yeah and yeah. give some hints on how to recreate this image, imagination. But I'm, I'm not interested, like I'm not a, also during rehearsals. I mean, I, I hope you all have experience in this way. I'm not like a policeman who sits there and say, okay, too late, too high, too low, too, you know, I'm just not interested in this stuff. <laughs> I'm more interested in, in creating a specific central experience. And, and that's, that's for me the, the core of, of, of music and the core of, performing. Well, I, I think that um, you are unusual in that regard. And it's really wonderful that you are that way, because it sounds to me like instead of creating an object, a sonic object, mm. that, as you said, you know, the, where the performer's um, task is to realize that object as faithfully as possible, mm. right? Um, you instead are creating a kind of uh, an invitation where you've established, you're making pretty clear uh, how, you're how you, you exercise control in certain ways, but you allow the performers mm -hmm. to invite the performers to, to have some agency and to uh, mm -hmm. contribute something of their own. You welcome that. And I think that that's, that's a fundamental distinction between you and me for that matter, and uh, <laughs> a lot of composers. I mean, I, I'm very, I, one reason why I really like the piece. Um, it's interesting, you, uh, Yarnwire folks, you remember when we had the artist conversation and we were explaining these different uh, types of, uh, of rhythm or, or of time, synchronous and, and asynchronous time. And uh, they, someone asked you, and you were so game for this, someone asked uh, you to take a part of the piece that's supposed to be free or a little freer, play it strictly. And it was, and you, you did. Oh, but we played was, it with a metronome. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> and it was funny because it wasn't the piece at all. It was, it was something else. But I think what it, what it really pointed up in a way is that um, when you shifted into that mode, you, your own agency and your own, your listening was subtracted from what the audience was hearing. And so it was a very interesting experience of hearing something that had been full of life because it was, it was free and somewhat organic, be reduced to something that was mechanical. 
Mm -hmm. and, and that was obviously not what you want. But it is interesting in this piece, Klaus, that you, um, you have some of the pieces, some parts of the pieces of the mm -hmm. piece that you say this should be played freely, but then you stipulate I think it's five different mm. uh, portions of the piece uh, that be, should be performed uh, in a synchronized mm. way. And you say, you know, it's important to be synchronized yeah. at this point. I'm um, kind of curious with Yarnwire, how did you all sort that out? It's seamless in performance now and in the performance that's recorded. It's a seamless process. It's very difficult to really tell exactly when that starts. But how did you go about um, uh, working on that? I think that's it's kind of the result of years of chamber music, you know, knowing how to communicate things like that. And it was it wasn't easy, I will say, like to figure out how to do it. But um, the way the piece works is in the, you know, and we're calling it freer for lack of a better really you know, music, um, we do have a timer that's going that allows us to, and, and it's in the score too, these timings that help us yes, kind of right. orient ourselves um, in the music. And so we know when one of the synchronous times is coming and like you do in, you know, chamber music mm -hmm. all the time, you designate a leader. Mm -hmm. And so we have a leader who's going to help us get into those synchronized parts. Mm -hmm. And so when we are approaching those, um, I think it's usually Laura, um, when we're approaching those, uh, she'll give a cue and we kind of start going with her. And then it, it's kind of, it's magical for me too, as a performer, yeah. because, um, you know, I'm going, I love the title of the piece, Molten Trees, right? It has this kind of liquid nature yes, to yes, it. And yes, that's yes, how yes, I'm yes, feeling yes, while yes, I'm playing yes, it. Yes. But it, then when I get to these, these parts, it's just like, you snap back into reality mm -hmm, or something, mm -hmm. you know, or, or focus, or, you know, it's just like, you're able to have this laser like focus on this moment. And, and it's not like we're grooving real hard, like we do in some pieces, but we are together moving together at that moment. And it's, it's awesome. Well, yeah. It's kind of like, if ahead, we're ahead, all like, I think of the, like, I was just thinking about this also looking at that beautiful picture of Klaus playing on the cliff, you know, uh, with the, the sky and, and behind him, this big open. And I was thinking about like the ocean and it's like, we're all drifting along these little yeah, parts yeah. and we're close to each other, but we haven't quite caught the same current. And those moments, it's like, we're pulled into the same current before we diverge again, back into our own floating mm -hmm. areas. Yeah. Uh, I could imagine it in uh, choreographic terms you yeah. know, of, of having four independent people who are moving. They're moving in clearly it's, it's coordinated in some way, but there's differences in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden you realize, no, it's they're now a unit. Yeah. Or before right. they before they go again into being uh, having a little bit more more freedom. Laura, I think you, you had selected a, a an excerpt that might help us hear this a little bit. I did. And there is another moment uh, besides the, there are these, you know, sort of architectural moments where the four of us line up, but then there are also um, these really beautiful moments uh, where Ning and I play claves together. And those mm -hmm. are, uh, we're not necessarily coordinated quite exactly with Ian and Russell, but she and I are connected together, yes. Yes. Um, yes. which is, and it's also just so sonically different and visually different than than what is happening in a lot of other parts of the piece. Um, and I think in the excerpt I chose, you hear a little bit of the you know the floating music, um, and there is a, again a bit of the the clave playing, and and Ning and I are just like laser focused across this you know stage or cathedral or wherever we might be. And I, I just want to say that. Um many percussionists might flam these these clave hits but uh here we have two pianists who are nailing the mostly, percussion part mostly, mostly. nailing <laughs> yeah. I, so uh, yeah kudos props it's actually it's pretty intense uh, I, I, guess, watching you do I guess it's it. the yeah. hardest part i guess it's the hardest part part in the piece the clave it is i think so yeah <laughs> the only place where i truly feel nervous during this <laughs> so can we should we hear may, that may, yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Klaus. Go ahead. Uh, may I add just one more thing to this? Be, be, because you you were pointing out this difference between moments of 
precise coordination and like more floating processes. Yeah, yeah. And I think, of course, there. It, it, for for me, whenever you do something within a piece, it has to have several layers of meaning to it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for me, I just wanted to point out from from a, like the compositional point of view. It's also that whenever I try to write a piece and usually my material is quite limited it's very mm -hmm. like minimalist in a, mm -hmm. some in a certain way yeah. but if you look closely at the material it's uh, organized like a Japanese garden so the whole world is basically within this small material mm -hmm. so on the one hand we have one extreme of, of complete floating but also uh, the, the other extreme of extreme precision so even though the piece seems to be very limited in its scope, everything mm -hmm. is kind of condensed into the piece. And this is also a function of having these two extremes in the piece from, from a compositional point of view, that you, that you kind of create a complete uh, universe within this little piece. So just one example of, of a moment of precision in in uh, in yeah, all yeah. of the freedom. But... Perfect precision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a masterclass. Um, so um, moving on here, Klaus, um, you provide three choices for temporal organization um, or for the piece, um, and this is in the in the beginning in the notes. You say that you can the, the musicians can either do it with one player who has a stopwatch. Uh, all players have a stopwatch, or three, no players have a stopwatch. Um, Yarnwire, which option did you select and why? <laughs> We've done all with stopwatch, but I think we tried one with, I think we've tried all three, mm -hmm. but I, if I'm remembering correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, the all with stopwatch actually allowed um, the most individual freedom to kind of navigate one's part fluidly and not be kind of always checking in with with the entire ensemble for these moments of coordination so yeah in in one way it seems like all stopwatches would be the least freedom but it's actually the opposite for us at least yeah <laughs> totally if somebody else were playing this piece they might have a completely different perspective mm -hmm. and experience mm -hmm. but that's what we found yeah no, but, but i think that this also reflects my experience that uh yeah. very strict rules create a lot of freedom mm -hmm. and i think that's my compositional process is like yeah. this and also the the performance is like this. also when i perform my own pieces also in ensemble i really love to play with stopwatches because it it allows you so much freedom and mm -hmm. and you have you know you can't get lost <laughs> right i mean yeah you don't, yeah. You don't have yeah. to be afraid yeah. oh who is where, where i am now and, and it's, it's really it feels very comfortable to perform it like this and that's so i totally understand that you chose this option uh -huh. and but i mean maybe you know if you perform this piece 100 times 
then at some point maybe you don't need the stopwatch anymore but mm. but still i think it for me it's a very obvious choice and i think it also was also the first choice i gave in the list yep yeah. i i i want to uh say that i i really enjoy uh also the timers start while you're off stage oh um, I think that's in the score, or maybe we did that in yeah. rehearsal. Yeah. Um, no, it's in score. I, the whole yeah, score I, is notated in this way, so it has minus yeah. two minutes. Yeah, I, I really, I, I love that, and that's become it's important to me now, actually, because it's, it's a tool, but it's not a. I don't know. It's an invisible tool, really. For it's like an invisible conductor or something. And I, right. I think it's it's good for the the flow and the drama of the piece. Yeah, we've thought about that now in lots of different pieces where we have to use timer. Is actually like, what does it look like? How does that change maybe someone's experience as an audience member to see people, you know, cueing a timer, you know, on stage? Yeah. It it breaks something somehow. So yeah. and, and and not cueing it only once, but maybe four times until everybody yeah. actually. Yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel, oh my screen's off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the worst. Um, well, moving on to uh, to your writing, Klaus, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of words that have been coming up here uh, in the piece. Uh, freedom, We've, that mm -hmm. word has come up already in this conversation. Time has clearly mm -hmm. been uh, part of the conversation. But the last word in your title is politics. Mm -hmm. So we're going to maybe be able to connect these things a bit here. Um, I asked that uh, on page 48, uh, there's a section of the, of the so I went, I, I'm going to read and it can, maybe it can be displayed. Mm. I'm trying to compose music which turns sound into time made audible. I think that this is only possible when sound is just sound because only then it is, is it, it is perceivable as that which it really is a temporal phenomenon, audible time. But again, at this point, yet another seemingly paradoxical discontinuity shows. When we enter through listening, a state of pure presence in which music becomes pure duration, we are leaving temporality. When time becomes pure presence, it dissolves. Through listening, time becomes eternity very provocative. Could you say a little bit more when you say about pure presence? Uh, why is it provocative? <laughs> <laughs> no, pro provocative, provocative. For me, it's the most normal it's thing. Stimulated. It's, yeah. <laughs> but what, do you, what do you mean about pr pure presence? I mean, I think this is not, for, for me, this is nothing special. I mean, this is something that everybody at some point has experienced in his life that when you're doing something, that you're really focusing on what you're doing and that you're completely immersed in what you do and completely become one with what you do or dissolve in, mm -hmm. into the action that you're doing, dissolve into the action. And in the, in the case of music, it's the, the act of playing and listening at the same time for the musician or for the audience, just the act mm -hmm. of, of listening and by being really in this presence of listening, just listening, you're just um, losing any any sense of time, basically. No? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, that's what I try to describe in this par paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. I think it yeah. comes up a lot now, at, at least in the US, in, in um, articles as flow state. Flow, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But, but I mean, yeah. th that like every, if you look, if you look at children playing, yeah. yeah, I mean that that's I mean it's a very natural state of being. It's just a state that that through our maybe education and through our like like how our life is organized, we completely forget about this. We all have our constantly like some some little disturbances like cell phones or computers or whatever. So it's very hard to in in this world uh, to really focus on being where you are you're always constantly in different times and in different places at the same time through the all the, the technology and all the devices that are surrounding you and and, and kind of conquering your 
uh, attention basically. And so for me, this is one, and that's why I'm also talking about this so, so much, because for me, this is one of the most essential things that art can provide in this world at this very moment, yes. to create these spaces that are free from all the garbage <laughs> that is thrown at us constantly. And, and so I think it's very important for me, it's very important that, that I have also in because you were also mentioning the word politics. Yeah, <laughs> yes, our right. society. This is, I think, one of the most important functions that I have nowadays as a composer, to remind people that these states are here, that they are an important part of of of, of human beings, of, of of being a human being, and that I will try to provide these chances for these experiences, and that's mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why i write the way i write mm -hmm. that's, maybe that's, that's why the internet was trying to take us down earlier <laughs> <laughs> i was person. checking i was <laughs> checking my email could you just say that again <laughs> yeah right yeah. Okay. i i do have to say klaus um i i love hearing you say say this stuff because all of my memories of playing this piece um i look forward to playing it because i I'm allowed to be in that space. And while I'm in that space, um, I'm both conscious of it, but, you know, I don't want it to end. But when it does end, you know, I feel it was, uh, you know, it was an honor to be able to enter enter those spaces. So um, it's working from a performer's standpoint, at yeah. least. <laughs> it's very, it's very it's, restorative, it's really yeah, actually, it really performing this piece. And it's like, I kept thinking about, yeah, you. I made a joke about being anxious or nervous during parts of the piece, mm. but really the experience of it is a total lack of anxiety, which mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. I mean, that's. I mean, I'm also, as I said, I'm also performer myself, and when I perform music, I don't want to be, you know, horrified and <laughs> don't want to be afraid of of, yeah. of having to perform something. Yeah. I really want to enjoy performing it and, and and share this joy with the audience that is listening to it. I don't want to be like a, you know, I, I, like a circus artist who performs very difficult uh, loops or something. I really want to, you know, enjoy being on stage and performing on stage. And I, I hope that my music also can create this um, opportunity for musicians. But but it, I do think it's so significant. It's been coming up and up again and again in this conversation that you've composed this piece in such a way that it not only um, involves uh, an array of sounds, but it involves array an array of levels of concentration and relationship and changing relationships between the performers. Mm -hmm. That is what you were talking about, Russell. I think at the very beginning uh, of um, listening differently. Um, I, I, I think that that's, that is so key that um, you're not, that the meaning of this piece, I'm gonna call it the meaning of it, the purpose of the piece is not just the uh, relationships that you've established among the tones uh -huh. or, the relation to, or, or some kind of a abstract structure, that this is music that actually is intended to not do one thing particular to you, but it's inviting the listener to enter into a space where if you wanna call it uh, you know, kind of pure presence or whatever, but it is inviting that experience. And I do think that, that you know, that is more politically relevant now um, or socially contributive for the reasons that you gave. Um, anytime, I mean, for us to spend 10 minutes undistracted um, is a lot now. And that's it's true. And that's really a terrible thing, but it's, <laughs> yeah. but it's true. Um, I wanted to ask you about one other uh, excerpt from this on um, page 52 you write um, the choices of compositional principle express a political view the form and structures of music mirror mirrors a view a world view mm. could, I think you've started to relate that to molten trees but could you say more about that yeah just uh, uh, picking up where we started before yeah like yeah. the structure with the stopwatches uh, also is a very, um, let's say a free structure because it means that, that, that there is no, no conductor who is actually cueing people in and out. And at, at some points people are 
helping each other. <laughs> That's how I would like to yeah. see it. But That's but true. it's not it's not like somebody forces someone to start now. But it, the the I think the piece is also meant as a uh, collaborative effort of a group of people. Yeah. Yes. The sound is not, and also, you know, there's no solo part, there's no accompaniment. Everybody right. is the, has the same level of, of importance within the piece. Mm -hmm. And in some moments, somebody is maybe more important, but at other moments, somebody else is more important. So, so there's this kind of, um, um, <laughs> this, this, this idea of a musical structure that is non-hierarchical. Right. Right. It's also reflected in in the the way the piece is performed. It's not it's a non hierarchical uh, field basically where people are interacting and creating this uh, structure. So yeah. I, I um, that, this is also one of the reflections of these po political ideas that I was. Mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. Um, it's so useful from a social standpoint to watch people really listening to each other. And inviting you to yeah. enter into that process with them, um, it's, it's yeah, really it's, exceptional. It, and it's collaboration in this sense. Yes. No, it, it, yes. it's mutual help and collaboration. Yes. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it, it's, it's not somebody is ruling and the others have to follow. No? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's a it's a wonderful piece, and we all want to hear much more of your music, yeah. and uh, and we want to hear Yarn Wire live. We want to hear this piece as a member of an audience. <laughs> In a large space, so that you're you're picking up on the vibes of the audience as well, right? Because that there yeah. is that field of interaction that this mm -hmm. piece clearly clearly is engaging. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, well, I, I really thank you, Klaus, for joining us in this conversation. It's been it's been really illuminating. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And thank you for performing my music in the first place. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's great. Absolutely. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. Well, this conversation is is actually speaking of being in a moment. It's it's been so wonderful uh, having this moment with everyone today. And and uh, wait for... a minute, <laughs> it's someone's birthday today. Oh wait, you're right. <laughs> really? It is. It is. Happy birthday. Oh. Happy birthday. <laughs> yes. Happy birthday. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> Love that glitter. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And if that weren't enough, then today, uh, also at uh, five thirty Eastern Standard Time, um, Steve is being honored for thirty years of service to New College. Uh, and so, if you are interested, um, both in joining that event or even knowing what the New Music New College series is doing in the future, you can visit the New College website uh, events and there's lots more information to be found there. And also for anyone who's interested in hearing more of Klaus's music, uh, he has had some very recent presentations uh, that were part of the Vien Modern Festival. And so you can go to the uh, Vien Modern website. I believe it's Vien Modern uh, dot at is the website address so you can find more there um, a wonderful orchestra piece and much more so this week we do have another episode tomorrow friday december 4th we'll be chatting here uh, with natasha deals who we saw the other day and norwegian composer oven torvind and then our next episode after comes on tuesday december 10th with thomas meadowcroft and lara per pellegrinelli so don't miss those subscribe to our channel so you don't miss an episode and if you'd like to support this project uh, please join us over on patreon.com where you can contribute to the project in exchange for very cool benefits, uh, which you can read more about there on the Patreon website. Thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful week and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.